Welcome to our book club. This is Elle Griffin. I'm the editor of Hoppa uh, Business Magazine, and I am here with Brandon Fugel, who is putting his shades down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brandon is the chairman of Colliers, and he's also a tech investor and um, has invested in a lot of AI technologies, which is why we have him here to talk about the book today. Um, for those of you just joining us, I see we've got a mic now coming in. Um, the book was AI Superpowers. It's uh, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. Um, so it was about, it's about the development of AI technology and how that has really started to be at the forefront of both U.S. and Chinese technologies. Brandon, before we got on, you were telling me some, what you thought was interesting about the book. I was wondering if you could kind of reiterate that. Yeah, I, I, I really found the book to be fascinating and it's, it's, it's a pretty easy read. Uh, Mr. Lee really, I think, brings a, a different perspective to how artificial intelligence is really transforming the way that we live, work, play, and how the United States and China have not only been a battle, but taking much different approaches to uh, really implementing artificial intelligence and AI into, into everything that, uh, that really, I think, influences the way we shop and, uh, and live. And so it's, it, it, it's been interesting. For a decade, I have been watching with great interest as China has invested so much money into their space program, for example, uh, while the United States uh, has lagged behind and, of course, has, has pretty well ceded to private industry. If it wasn't for the likes of SpaceX, Blue Origin, and others that are funded by you know, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and, uh, and, and really some of the key influencers, the United States really be in a weakened position relative to space supremacy and, and really the future of the next frontier. And I look at AI as, as being only the next frontier, but something that has already arrived at our doorstep and is influencing everything that we're doing, whether we recognize it or not. Um, to, he really, he takes a really good look at those differences between the United States and China, and even weighs in with Russia uh, being a major player in the future in, uh, in, in leveraging AI in order to, I think, monitor their citizenry and also um, have a competitive edge in the future. And it's scary. I mean, a, a lot of it, I think, is, uh, is cause for concern. And I, I like the fact that this book underscores really those differences and it, in a way, to me, is a call for action for those of us in the United States that are funding, you know, new ventures and innovation companies um, and those initiatives that are AI related. So we've had some fire alarms here. Um, I don't know what's going on in our building today, but uh, um, there it's, I apologize for the, uh, some of the noise in the background if it ends up being distracting. Hopefully it's uh, not a real fire and you need to get yeah, out of there. <laughs> I don't think so. We have a lot of construction see they just shut it off just now. But I, I actually found the book to be even though it you know it came out in 2018, I find that many of the points that Mr. Lee really punctuates in his book, um, yeah, I, I find that they're more relevant today than they were even two years ago. And and I think uh, it, it, it was it was really an opener for me as I delved into it and really cared what we're dealing with even here in this COVID pandemic and how much technology has both, I think, helped us in, in significant ways to continue to do business and to be able to interact, but it's also uh, a handicapping, uh, you know, it's also a handicapping issue that we have to address in, in how much of our freedom and how much of our world is going to be dictated to by, uh, by I think, a lot of these new approaches and advances. But, uh, you know, you take, for example, TikTok, very popular app. And if you talk to AI experts, um, you know, the emergence of, of TikTok has is, is created a lot of concern that was, you know, that was first voiced in, in book, you know, when he's just looking kind of from a broad brush, uh, broad brush 
approach to applications that are being developed in China that you, you look at uh, you look at how much uh, how much TikTok has really enabled China to catalog from a face recognition standpoint and really you know tracking body movements and everything else. It, it's allowed them to, I think, in a, in a really uh, concerning way, track not only their citizenry, but also build a data globally that they can mine in service to, to really having a competitive edge. And I think we need to be very, very security conscious uh, in the United States and ever more vigilant because uh, intellectual property rights are, are frankly non-existent in China. And, and, you know, it's, it's such a different society and different political structure that, uh, that it could very well uh, be, a, be very detrimental to us if we don't take a more proactive approach. But you know, what, what were your thoughts? I, I, I found it fascinating and it was a real wake up call for me. Yeah, I thought, I thought it was really interesting how, um, you know, to your point about data, one of the things that they have working really well for them is that WeChat app and how they use it for just about everything. I, spe I specifically thought it was interesting when they started talking about using microloans via your phone instead of using uh, credit cards. So they would, right. you know, they can shop anywhere, any portal using just their phone. They don't have to get out a credit card or anything, but because they don't have a credit card, um, they basically use instead these kind of microloans and what the the app uses is all of the data they're collecting about you from that WeChat app to decide whether or not you're good for the money and how they're even looking at things like how fast you type in your birth date or um, or like what, um, I forget something, something else, it was like how you type in your name and like little tiny little tiny tweaks that they're looking at of all the data that they're gathering for you to, 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 to to determine with better accuracy than a loan lender who has access to like how much you make in a year and uh, what your last two pay stubs have been. They're looking at all this like micro data about you to determine, well, you're going to be good for this money based on our data that shows that people born on after this date or people that enter in their name this fast, they're good for the money or people. Um, and, and I thought that was really fascinating, but that requires them to have access to all of the data that they're gathering from everybody's phones in all of China to be able to make those decisions um, and how they're able to do that by not having really, their privacy is not a concern. They're just like, we'd rather, we'd rather like have the data. Um, whereas here, privacy concerns are a real thing and we're like, we don't want you to have my data, we don't want you to have access to that, even though that data could be very, very powerful in mass. Yeah, it, it, it can be both intrusive and, uh, you know, the, that data aggregation and using AI can also be very enabling as well. You know, I, I found, you know, there was a, there was a section of the book that addressed how, um, how China's move to a cashless society has has had a positive impact on reducing crime. In fact, it's disrupted crime. And uh, there's this, uh, this section here where it says, cash has disappeared so quickly from Chinese cities that it even disrupted crime. And uh, they had a pair of Chinese cousins that made headlines with a hapless string of robberies. Uh, and the pair had traveled uh, to a wealthy city and home to Alibaba which, with the goal of making a, a number of lucrative scores and and then skipping town and you know armed with knives they go out to uh, to convenience stores only to find that owners had almost no cash to hand over to them you know as they went from place to place you know they they couldn't on their so-called crime spree they they had a hard time coming up with anything that could even cover their travel expenses let alone you know, allow them to uh, to really prevail. And, uh, you know, one of the brothers cried out, you know, upon arrest, you know, how is there no cash left in, in Hengzhou? And it's, it's, it's amazing. It, it's a positive byproduct. Private. It's a positive byproduct of, uh, of this, this new wave of innovation and the way their society shifted. But, uh, you know, with, 
with this, I think comes both positive and negative um, impact. And I think in the United States where we treasure innovation and the first to market advantage, uh, I think we, we underestimate that the Chinese aren't about innovation or first to market. They're about, frankly, stealing whatever they can and leveraging it in order to, uh, to drive revenue. And, uh, and it's, the, the, it's not just the cultural differences, but also the, uh, the, the ethics challenges that uh, we've encountered. Um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of Trump hatred out there and this is a very divisive uh, political uh, climate that we, that we live in. But I, I have to tell you, love him or hate him, the one thing that I think everyone can agree on for the most part is, you know, Donald Trump um, as our current president is, is really the only president that has stood up to China. And their, uh, their constant uh, breaches and, uh, and abuses of not only stealing our intellectual property, but also manipulating currency and trade. And I, you know, I think that we, again, as a country, we need to fortify ourselves and we need to be prepared for the fact that, that the rules of engagement are much, much different in Asia. You know, the book, you know, Miss Lee's book points out how different, uh, how polar opposite our cultures are and the ethics employed by our cultures relative to you know, competition and innovation. And, and, and how that plays into AI and the way that AI is going to be leveraged and deployed in service to competitive advantage should give everyone cause for concern when really tackling China as, a, as not only a, a, an adversary in trade, but also as we're, we're trying to lead everything from the space race to the next wave of technology initiatives. Yeah, it's interesting. I do want to let everybody know who's who's listening. If you want to chime in on the book or bring up something that's that's uh, of interest to you, just raise your hand. There's a setting in Zoom where you can raise your hand and I can call on you and allow you to talk. Or if you have questions, um, you can enter those into the chat window and we'll bring those up. Um, but I do I do think that, that that was an interesting part of the book. And, and in fact, I saw kind of an example of that in the news this week. It was saying that um, China has been trying to tackle the food waste problem because every like restaurants, you know, you leave a restaurant, you leave half your food on the plate. And if everybody does, does that, you end up with way, way like you're over the restaurants are over buying, um, and end up with just food being wasted. And then, you know, obviously there's other places in the world where there's not enough food. So it's kind of a strange, strange problem. And one of the ways that China is trying to solve that is by regulating um, restaurants, how big of a portion restaurants are allowed to sell. So of course, you can see on the positive, the positive would be, oh, well, if you regulate the portion size of a restaurant, then no restaurants have to compete with other restaurants and say, well, we have way more food on your plate. So you'll want to come here and put that place that has a small food size. Um, it'll even the playing field in that regard and potentially avoid food waste. But the negative is, well, now you have the government controlling how businesses can run their business. And is, is that a good idea? That's something we grapple with a lot in the U.S. is we don't want government telling us how to run our business. So I think that's an interesting divide, right? It's like, where is that line of, of we could improve society if we just do this, but we don't want the government to do it. Well, true. And, and you know, Mr. Lee points out that AI um, is really showing how, you know, global inequality may be... Uh, maybe even more pronounced in the future. I mean, if you, if you put really the power disproportionately in the hands of two nations, the United States and China, he, he points out that those, uh, that those four countries will most likely stagnate while the AI superpowers take up. And what, what kind of negative impact will that have overall on, on really global markets? Um, as, as companies, or not companies, but as countries are deprived of their ability to, to you know, to emerge out of poverty, you know, you know, what kind of competitive disadvantage will they have to overcome uh, due to the fact that the superpowers in this race 
uh, are really kind of monopolizing eating out. I mean, it's interesting. The United States, without question, I think had first mover advantage. I mean, we are, uh, you know, we are a, a truly innovative culture, you know, that's a pioneering entrepreneurial spirit uh, that we find here in the United States is a real differentiator and is very different than you know, Asian culture. Uh, and what what China is really looking to uh, to create in its its next wave of, of leadership, and uh, and I think leaning heavily into uh, the U.S. being a, being a leader and being able to hopefully take positive approaches to differentiate, you know, artificial intelligence uh, as a as a as as something that can be enabling and can 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 enable all boats to rise with the tide, with technology, with data aggregation, and with all of this this new access that we have. Um, hopefully, it'll help improve quality of life globally, not just in the United States or China. But it it remains to be seen what will truly happen. And I think one of the concerns brought up in the book is the inequality. Uh, between countries that will be created by virtue of the, the current climate. Yeah. Uh, you're invested in several tech companies and in AI. Um, do you see lack of data or privacy issues being a concern in those businesses? Constantly. It was funny. I, I co-founded and invested in a company called Cypher that developed a, a software algorithmic approach noise cancellation uh, for smartphones and uh, internet of things uh, enabled devices and we were constantly uh, dealing with you know potential breaches and concerns with our intellectual property being stolen by china by uh, by interests in asia that would you know that would essentially take everything that we had invested in and you know, come up with a, a cheaper stripped down approach and thus undermine everything that we were trying to bring to market. I mean, we ultimately, you know, prevailed and we're fortunate in that, uh, and that we are able to sell, you know, Cypher to a large global company that is now, you know, introducing our, our, you know, software into to devices, I think on a, on a large scale that will improve you know, quality of, you know, communication experience we're already seeing manifest in smartphones, but uh, we are under constant attack during the several years that we were in the R&D stage and, and in constant fear that our IP was going to, was, was going to be lifted and uh, that we, we would, in essence, I, I think, lose that advantage in going to market. And I think, you know, now more than ever, you know, it's it's really become you know one of the, the the leading concerns. You can have all the patents in the world, but if everyone isn't playing by the same rules of engagement, uh, it's a real challenge internationally. Yeah, that's super interesting, um, especially because for A to I to work, you need to have lots and lots and lots of data points. Um, and if you don't have access to those at a large scale or there's privacy concerns and the AI basically doesn't work, which could put us behind, especially since China can, has access to way more. Yeah. Um, well, and there's benefits, right? You know, right. I, I've been writing, a, writing an article recently about um, electric cars and electric bikes, which have both been hugely booming right now um, because of COVID. And one of the things I found super interesting is I was able to extrapolate data from the company Fitbit. Um, Fitbit oh, was yeah. collecting you know, data from everybody that's wearing a Fitbit device. And we're, we're actually sharing that data with the world as, um, as they were, you know, as COVID was happening. And they were able to actually say, 
This is how pe people have increased movement during these months of COVID shutdowns. People have increased their calorie, like the calories that have, they've been burning. People have their heart rate, their resting heart rate is down. People have been sleeping more. So they were actually able to like show all this data. And I was like, oh my God, this is fascinating. Like think about how the health repercussions for knowing that oh, by getting more sleep and using our cars less, suddenly like we're more healthier as a population, like think about, and so then of course I go to Apple and Apple's like, sorry, we don't even know that data. We don't even have access to that data. And I'm like, I get, I get why you're, I get why that's your party line because privacy is important to a lot of people, but also like, it seems like a missed opportunity to me because you could learn sure. so much. Well, you can improve quality of life. You've seen that evidenced with the with the appropriate use of that data. There's so much you can do in order to not only improve the user experience, but also be able to calibrate your lifestyle to yeah. really take advantage of that and, and to see real measurable improvements. See, that's what AI does: is it provides you with with you know the ability to see measurable improvement and to move at light speed in a big way. It's all about the you know the ability to to harness and leverage data in new ways to really propel all aspects of life forward. You know, one thing that the book, um, you know, brings up, of course, is uh, the, the fact that if data is the new oil, you know, China is the new Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and Mr. Li, of course, you know, thinks the artificial intelligence industry in China, you know, will will really position them as a, as a leader and, and, you know, creates a, a scenario where there really may be a, an imbalance. And I think, you know, the United States government and the, the companies that are really leading our technology industry and our community uh, need to be aware of what I believe is, is a bit of an unfair competitive advantage that it, it is out there. I mean, the participation of China's central government in funding and raising the status of the AI industry is astounding. And, you know, we don't see any of that in the United States. States. Um, you know, that kind of um, advantage that they have and, and the ability to be more aggressive in, uh, in the way that they're tackling, you know, the opportunity. I mean, you brought this up earlier in the call that they're really very few intellectual property restrictions that exist. I mean, they have few barriers to, uh, to really being able to, to go out having a sweeping impact. Um, a lot of it is it's, it's, it's due to the culture. And uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. What, what, what lies in certain 5, 10, 15 years in the future as, you know, as the winners emerge, there will be the inevitable losers. Um, that also emerge and that, you know, one thing we need to do is make sure that we protect our quality of life and, uh, and our economy in the process. Yeah, I'm sad um, Brian Brandenburg wasn't able to make it today because I feel like he could have really spoken to the health side of AI. Um, but they did address it uh, in the book in uh, the oh. Chinese RX thinking. Um, they use uh, they use hundreds and hundreds or not hundreds millions of data points on medical records, medical health, and even scan medical publications in order to make a diagnosis of somebody with a set of ailments and even to to recommend a treatment. Um, and I found it really fascinating, especially because as a journalist, when we're looking for health data to say, here this this if you have these symptoms, that probably means you have this or if you have this disease, then this is the best treatment. The way that those are um, decisions are being made are by clinical trials and by studies. And the people that participate in clinical trials and studies are like severely low quantities of people. They're like a small subpopulation of the people. Now, think about what you could do if you're like this this company in China and you can you can access millions and millions of data points about a person and really be able to say, well, with fine-tuned accuracy, more accurate than a doctor who might have read something in, in a medical journal 10 years ago about the subject, or 
you know, you could actually be way more accurate in your diagnosis and more accurate in your treatment because you have access to how it works for the population at large, as opposed to just how it worked in this study. I found, I was like, that seems like a no brainer. We need to do that. Yeah, I agree. But you are invested though in Zenergy, right? Or you... so in Zenergy, I mean, Brian Brandon is doing some really interesting, you know, in interesting work with Zenergy and and utilizing artificial intelligence and and I think a, a very immersive approach to to AI in order to, to bring educational tools to the market um, and and also you know help people you know in the the health sciences sector be able to to use data to better understand even even the current COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. And, and being able to tackle the nature of the virus itself and, and be able to use data visualization and, and a lot of the, the, the approaches that he has uh, in order to, I think, better position us to come out of this in a positive way. I think that the COVID-19 thing is actually a very interesting case study because this is the first time where we have global data on one particular virus strain and exactly what's going on with it reported by every single state and country. We, can, we have more information now about coronavirus than we do other viruses that come and go. We where we don't we don't track them like this on a global scale and have access to this kind of data. It's it's really fascinating. Yeah. And I, I want to, we had a question from, uh, from a participant, I'd be happy to, to address it uh, relative to, to some of the political uh, climate and co political implications here. I, I wasn't trying to, uh, to take any political side in this, uh, this discussion, I'm trying to be apolitical. Uh, I, you know, I think we can indeed confront China uh, in partnership with with those that we have called allies in the past and by having a more unified, cohesive approach, uh, I, I definitely think there's better approach in the future to, to confronting some of these challenges. But I, I, I am going to say, you know, China has run amok. I mean, they've been able to, to basically abuse, uh, abuse us in a lot of ways and run unchecked and have not been held accountable you know, both the government and state funded enterprises that have have targeted our technology industry and been able to do so and, and really violate uh, violate us indiscriminately. And so I think we need to we need to take a uh, I think a more aggressive and, and frankly a more uh, organized approach to establishing uh, I think better rules engagement with China and with others um, that that are going to be a, a uh, that are going to be a factor in the future. But I appreciate the the statement and uh, and I understand where people are coming from. Yeah. Do you think that um, do you think that we need to be more? I mean, aggressive competitively with China on the on the AI side. No, I think we need to establish. Better rules of engagement, and it's not just China, it's Russia. I think, I think we do need to have better relationships with our with our allies in order to, to I think, avoid conflicts that are are going to be even more prominent in the future. Uh, as 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 data and uh, and using AI. Uh, on a on a global scale, really transforms our world in both positive and negative ways. I think the the book uh, the book actually does a good job. I mean, Mr. Lee tries to address you know some of the the different approaches and some of the challenges we're seeing, and that are even more important today. Now you know, two years later after the book was originally published, it it amazes me how much er everything continues to to morph and change. Yeah, um, I, I like too how he gave some examples of how AI can be rolled out. Um, he mentioned specifically a, a use case between 
Google's development of autonomous car um, technology and then um, versus Tesla's autonomous car technology, um, both of which are using AI to uh, make decisions in real time based on what if they'll crash under those conditions or not. Um, which was really interesting. It said like Google, so Google took six years to like send a car around with cameras and record a lot of, you know, a lot of the streets and everything to make those decisions while Tesla just like rolled out a patch uh, update to all of its cars and right. was able to get all of those miles and more in a six month period just because it was suddenly tracking all of its car fleet on the road that was already on the roads. Um, and and gather data about all of the the roads in the United States versus Google <laughs> getting the data slowly with a little car. I was like, well, that that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> right. No, it's it's uh, in interesting how again things that we 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 couldn't have even conceived of a decade ago are now taken for granted and and implemented uh, immediately and seamlessly into our world and I, I think there are so many positive benefits that that have come and that will be observed in the uh in the future in the the months and years to come i think we, we are just barely scratching the surface of of what you know what impact ai will have on again the way we work the way we live play you name it all aspects of uh of society were there any technology um, or use cases mentioned in the book that China is currently using that you wish we could implement in the U.S.? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you know. Again, I think you know one thing that you know China has has had. I think a lot more assistance. I mean, Chinese enterprises have had a lot more assistance and the ability to to move quicker at least over the course of the last few years. I mean, in recent years, they have accelerated, you know, their, their ability to go to market with technologies. But, you know, again, I reference TikTok as one really prominent polarizing example, uh, but there are, there are a host of others as well. I mean, in the United States, we have some exciting, you know, new companies that are emerging, they're prioritizing AI as well. There's a company called Hypergiant, in Austin, Texas, that is, you know, is applying, you know, artificial intelligence solutions to, to space, you know, to the space race, um, all the way down to just the way we, you know, the way we do business. And uh, it, it's, it's fun to see some of that innovation come out of, you know, our own, our own scrappy startups that are now, I think, emerging to, to really introduce new approaches. Yeah, I I really like. Um, I I mean, at the beginning of the book, I was kind of like, well, who cares if a if we dev can develop a system that can beat people in chess or go. <laughs> I get that they were early use cases for the AI, but but well, towards the end, when he starts talking about the medical implications and things like that, I just I find that fascinating. That seems yeah. like a great. Yeah. One thing I found also interesting. Uh, point out in the book was, you know, the threat to employment and how much AI is going to impact, um, you know, our job market. You know, you look at, you know, you know, the least threatened cognitive labor jobs, you know, from, you know, criminal defense attorneys, public relations uh, professionals, social workers, psychiatrists, or even CEOs. And then you also look at you know, those that are most threatened, everything, you know, from basic translation services to radiologists, who would have thought, I mean, I, that was one thing that, uh, that, that really, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, I found interesting was, was how much uh, the medical industry is going to be impacted in both positive and negative ways. I mean, the, the, uh, you know, the, the job market is going to adapt to AI in a big way in the next several years. And, you know, those, those jobs that have been commoditized or automated are, uh, 
are we going to phase out the human element in a big way? It's, it's kind of sad. I mean, if you try to, to, to resolve an issue with PayPal these days or Amazon, um, it's, it's very difficult to get a live body to, uh, to resolve issues that, that may arise. I mean, I had an issue where, um, you know, my credit card was stolen uh, and was being used by another PayPal user. And, you know, we needed to, to address, you know, immediately address the issues. And uh, we couldn't a live body on the phone uh, that would, I think, with priority, uh, address what was a really uh, a critical concern. And, and we can think, you know, of this move to AI for that, you know, taking the human interaction out of the equation uh, can have its, you know, have its, uh, have its challenges and be a, a very negative byproduct of this as well. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of, I feel, he, he does mention that a lot about the jobs and how, how in a lot of cases when new technologies have displaced old jobs, they actually made new ones and how that's, that's a prominent argument but how AI is going to be a little bit different because we'll actually be, it's not like we're replacing, changing what jobs the rote workers have from mining to agriculture. We're changing, we're eliminating those altogether. And in fact, even eliminating not just the rote work, but the skilled work and finding AI. If, if AI becomes more accurate at diagnosing a disease or at more accurate at driving a car than a human being, think about the massive scale of, of job loss that, that could occur. It, but when I, was, when I was starting to ponder that as I was reading it, I kind of was like, well, okay, what jobs would still be remaining that like a machine could not do better with millions of data points? And the only thing I could come up with was, okay, well, we'll need We'll need the engineers, like the software engineers, obviously, like tech will, will be big. Um, but also I think creative jobs might be in high demand. You know, somebody who's a writer um, or maybe someone that's a painter, some kind of skill that that is involving emotion and feeling and like physical, um, you know, interaction with somebody, I think will maybe be a benefit and, and maybe even a higher paid position than, than it is now. So I, I think that that could be interesting to see that play out. Well, yeah, human judgment and the role of the trusted advisor to help people navigate, you know, their decision-making process, transactions, and develop strategies that, that really can't be automated will be in high demand in the future. And you know, and you're right, you bring up, you know, everything from your assembly line workers to even truck drivers. I mean, you look at, you know, the rise of autonomous vehicles and now it's here. It arrived and it's, it is, uh, it is going to have an impact on us for, you know, for the rest of our lives. You know, the ability to, to, to really, I think, streamline that whole process and take the human element out of the equation is going to have a very disruptive impact on our economy and i think you know the key is you know it's innovation it's being able to transition well, you know with these changes we need to to leverage our strengths we need to leverage the fact that the you know the united states is an is, is an innovation factory you know i look back on you know bell labs for example you know as as really a, a place where basic research was able to thrive and, and being able to, to take new approaches to, to really employing all of the, the, that, that entrepreneurial spirit and service to innovation that will continue, I think, to differentiate in the States. In fact, that a great book to read is uh, The Idea Factory, uh, which is the rise of the labs and how much the innovation scene and, and really a focus on basic research that has, that has really disappeared from, from corporate America in general, because it's tough to put a, a return on investment, a, a clear return on investment uh, type of approach to, to basic research. I think we need to see a return to that. You know, we've seen some isolated cases, uh, you know, where, you know, you, you see some labs 
uh, that are being uh, being created. And Google is doing their best to try to bring new um, technologies to market and new approaches through Google Labs. Um, you know, like Disney, even I mean Disney, you know Disney Labs. Uh, on the entertainment side of things is, uh, is trying to be innovative and, and jump ahead and jump forward. But I think we're going to really need to strengthen our approaches if we're to, to keep our, our competitive edge. Yeah, um, that, that's very true. Um, I, I also want to talk about perception AI. Um, I love the, the book said, uh, our interactions, but before perception AI, our interactions with the online world had to squeeze through two checkpoints, either our computer screen or our keyboard, um, and how perception AI will make it so that it no longer makes sense to think of yourself as going online because you can just order a meal by speaking a sentence from your couch, or right. your refrigerator at home tells you you're out of milk, or like you're where you're just you're almost never needing to interact with a screen to have access to that data. Um, and, and in fact, even um, in China, they're building a AI city specifically designed where all the cars will be autonomous and um, the, the grocery stores you'll be able to check out without ever swiping a credit card and, and, um, and, and kind of creating a smart city, which is kind of interesting, also kind of minority, minority report. Um, <laughs> but but the idea is, and I mean, I go through this on a, I have a Google Home, and I do speak to it a lot and tell it to set timers for me and and whatever. And I do love it when I'm cooking and can say how many minutes to poach an egg or whatever, and it, it makes it easy. But then I'll you know watch some movie that makes me scared of AI, and then I'll unplug it for a few hours because <laughs> so I don't want it to know what I'm doing the rest of the time. So yeah. There's, a, there's an interesting balance there, right? <laughs> yeah, they, well, the, there, there are very dystopian approaches or frightening yeah. <laughs> to, to the future of AI and its impact, but there are also some some really inspiring um, examples as well. You know, I, I really see our quality of life improving in a lot of ways in the future if, uh, you know, if, if employed in the right way. And I, yeah, it's, it is. It's it, too bad Brian isn't with us because I think where you see some of the most, I think, measurable and positive advances is really it's in the area of health sciences. It's in healthcare and the ability to improve our quality of life and you know our understanding of the human body and really tackling issues like like the pandemic and really even some of the more ho hum everyday. Uh, issues that we encounter as, as, as human beings. And I, I, I really see, uh, you know, innovative approaches to healthcare and health sciences being a, a, a frontier for AI that, uh, that we'll look back on with great pride. Yeah, I'm, I'm working with Brian on a story right now to that front and kind of a continuation of a, of a past story I wrote about, um, you know, Ancestry.com. I, I gave my yeah. saliva to Ancestry and they were able to use that to like build my family tree, find out exactly what part of the world I'm from, find out whether I'm predisposed to these diseases or these diseases. And I feel like we're only a little bit of data and a little bit of AI away from being able to say, to use that data to actually predict well, people like you and with your genes and with your skin type and with your fair hair and with your, or maybe you're going to more likely to get skin cancer or maybe you're going to be develop this. So I would recommend you get more, you know, of this. Or you might even get to the point where you're analyzing your, uh, you know, there's, um, what is it, Singapore that was playing with, you know, anal toilets that analyze your, your bodily excretions to be able to say, hmm, looks like you need more of this vitamin, or it looks like if you got some of this, that would help you. Right. Well, the possibilities are endless. You look at how much, how much good can be done and, you know, what, what a huge leap forward we can take in, in the addressing our own lifestyles in, in a positive way by, by utilizing data to, to troubleshoot and also I think, you know, I think enable truly pre preventative medicine 
I mean, the only way that you can do that is by, by really leveraging data and, and being able to, to, to couple that with, with new approaches and technologies that are being employed. I wonder if there's a way to have it all, to be able to grant companies the ability to look at all of our data, but do no harm with it. It seems difficult, but. Yeah. Well, don't, don't worry, it's, it's impossible. It, uh, <laughs> it's, I think, I think it's, it, you know, we're, we're gonna have challenges. I, unfortunately, I think, I think we're, we're just going to have to get grips with the fact that there will be some, uh, there will be some challenging um, aspects to this that, uh, that we'll have to address in the future. And, and I mean, it's, it, we're definitely not going to be living in a utopian society anytime soon. You look at what has happened the last several months and uh, the chaos that has been created, um, you know, it, people remote working, you'd think that people being at home more and, you know, remote working in a lot of ways would draw, draw them closer together and bring families together. But, you know, crime rates are up, you know, you know, it's, I, again, I don't want to get off on that tangent at all, but there are some really, really serious social um, issues that are being created uh, that we're going to need to, to address. I'm sure there will be entire books and movies um, that will that look back on this time and this day and and you know try to try to assess you know the pros and cons and you know where we failed where we were able to to really uh, see some advancement and some positive uh, benefits I believe in that I I believe that the utopia is available to us I mean even if you even if you look at the last 10,000 years of human history, I think we would say we're way better off today than we were 10,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago or 2,000 years sure. ago. Well, um, you, even look at, you even look at the state of treating cancer. You know, my, uh, my best friend in fifth grade is a radiation oncologist uh, that is, is nationally recognized. He's up in Spokane. And, uh, you know, he, he's, he's expressed so much excitement and, and feels that the future is full of promise relative to new treatments and the ability to improve uh, the way that uh, we not only diagnose, but also treat illness. And I think that there is a lot of cause for optimism. And I think that there are also, you know, there's also a flip side. There's there's uh, there are other issues that will need to be addressed with regard to, to artificial intelligence in the way that it will be employed negatively. Yeah, I, I think it also has to, a lot to do with who's calling the shots because it seems like you can you can tweak like you're mentioning. Okay, you make everybody stay at home and then crime rates go up. Like that's an interesting. That's an interesting data point. So then, are you, then do you say, okay, well, we need people leave their houses so that then crime goes down and, and you sort of fine tune society. Oh, we got to limit portion sizes in restaurants and then people will stop overeating and there won't be food waste. And over, you know, it's like you can, you can fine tune, you, we have a lot of information to, to say, you know, oh, if you eliminate cars from roads and people start walking and biking more and then they get healthier, you can, you can adjust a city to be better, but who's making those decisions and and what is their their yeah. why? What is their and, and I think that is that is one of the the real strengths of this book, this book AI superpowers, you know, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order is really the uh, the way that it sets the table and it really illustrates, you know, who the key influencers are going to be and, and the, the leaders when it comes to, to these topics in the future and, and really employing, you know, data and AI in service to improving quality of life and also, you know, economic advantage. Uh, it, we, we live in an increasingly competitive uh, environment and I think it's going to become even more competitive uh, within the global community. Um, 
and it, I think our ability to respond and 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 I think playing that sandbox in a positive way will will really either define us for good or for ill. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, even in um, AI and coding, it you can't that you know we're seeing that a lot now. You can't really eliminate for bias even when it comes to making decisions, which we would hope if that decisions made on data were completely unbiased, right? You can you can still build a biased machine um, by the way you code it. Exactly. Well, you know, garbage is they say garbage in, garbage out. I mean, it, you know, if if the data that is being collected and processed it, you know, is 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 flawed or incomplete, um, you know, or the wrong approach is taken, it, you know, it can have, it can have a very negative impact on, uh, on the outcome. So, yeah. you know, we, we see it in commercial real estate, you know, some markets are able to, to actually cull and process the data, provide a really good, I think, glimpse into what is happening real time relative to the economies, you know, whether it be in New York or Los Angeles, um, and it's it's due to either the quality of the data or uh, or the lack thereof. I mean, one thing that we've tried to do in the Utah community is utilize technology and uh, and and really, you know, I think merging the right type of software and approaches to processing proprietary data uh, and and intelligence in service to helping clients forecast and I think better anticipate not only you know cyclical change but also be able to I think quantify where they can realize cost savings. I mean you look at you know the approach to you know workspace environments and how you know new approaches and even using AI and you know data driven uh, approaches to really analyzing the workplace and being able to overcome some of the concerns that people have to densification and health and safety, you know, that will all play a role in the future. And it's already playing a role right now as companies are, are trying to, to address the concerns of today. So I, I found the book fascinating. I, I, it actually has, uh, has inspired me to pick up, um, you know, other, books and uh, other articles that's, that are that are addressing artificial intelligence today and and really tracking how much the markets are changing as a result. So I, I, uh, I have to uh, check out, I've got another uh, conference, but it, it's, it's been a pleasure uh, participating with, uh, with this uh, book club and uh, look forward to hopefully engaging with, uh, with you and Brian in the future to continue the dialogue. Uh, it's it's an interesting world we live in. No, th thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for everyone watching, we will be doing a deep dive AI panel with a bunch of AI industry experts in January. So stay tuned for that. Um, thank you all for joining us. Bye. Thank you.